So uh, one of the I'm I'm very excited for this session. And in addition to what Taya said about mine, this was another one I was really excited about. Mostly because when I work with entrepreneurs, one of the things that they'll often mention is when I have all these pressures that I'm facing in terms of starting my business, sometimes it's really hard to just communicate and stay honest about what's kind of going on. And I find it really interesting when we talk about integrity in the context of business, the fact that the definition of integrity is more uprightness with the quality of being honest. So you can't really have integrity without having honesty included in that. So I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Taya Cohen. Uh, Dr. Taya Cohen is a tenured professor here at Carnegie Mellon. Um, she co-directs the Collaboration and Conflict Research Lab and the Center of Behavioral Decision Research. Uh, she recently served as the president of the International Association for Conflict Management. And her work is on moral character, honesty, and negotiation, and is highly cited and received international media attention from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, uh, NPR, and uh, the BBC. And today she'll be joined with two other uh, speakers. So we have Darren uh, Firestone, who was previously a White House attorney and a federal prosecutor. And currently, he is the founder of CryptoWhistleblower.com. So he's been dealing with a lot of the different crypto scandals that we've, we've <laughs> it's hard to ignore these days in the media, and sort of give his perspective on, on honesty and dishonesty in the context of a new emerging financial construction. And then also Sophia Yen, who is the founder and CEO of Pandia Health, which is a company that helps women be able to have access to contraception and basic healthcare services. And so from there, I'll, I'll leave it to Taya to lead the session. Thank you, right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So people across the world value honesty. Individuals, organizations espouse it as a core value, claim to hold it in high esteem. And yet, we often fall short. One of the biggest insights from my research in this area is that we often do not communicate honestly because we overestimate the short-term harms of honesty and we underestimate the benefits of providing truthful information to those we communicate with and to our relationships. So our session today is focused on honesty and innovation. When it comes to innovation, introducing new technologies such as cryptocurrency and telehealth, honesty is particularly challenging because the pressure to perform is high there's uncertainty about the effectiveness and limits of the new inventions. So first, let's talk about cryptocurrency. Uh, new technology like cryptocurrency creates opportunities for fraud and dishonesty. Uh, Mr. Firestone, please briefly describe your work with us and share an example of a case in which innovation has led to fraud. Sure. Um, so I, I prepared for this question, and I have a deck. Um, you know, that's me. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I, I was a, a prosecutor with the Department of Justice. I, I prosecuted tax fraud uh, for a number of years. And, uh, and then when I went into the private sector, just a little bit less than 10 years ago, I started representing whistleblowers. And I've done a, a whole bunch of other things since then, but I got hooked up with a bunch of wonderful partners, including my partner, Bob Muse, who was Cynthia Cooper's lawyer when she was going through uh, the whistleblowing process. Uh, and nowadays, uh, I, as Taya said, I've been representing uh, people in the crypto industry um, because there's a lot of fraud there. Um, and I started this website, uh, CryptoWhistleblower.com. And I'm going to just tell you a little bit, and you can go to the website and find out more if you want, but uh, just a little bit about what laws there are for whistleblowers. And then I'll give you uh, just one example of uh, a crypto case uh, of fraud that may or may not have involved uh, a whistleblower. So in terms of the legal landscape, there's two major areas uh, for whistleblowers. Uh, and the, the common denominator here, quite frankly, is financial incentive. Right? The, the United States government, and there are other governments that do this as well, but none so robustly as the United States, uh, provides financial incentives now for whistleblowers to come forward. Um, so the SEC. The CFTC, the IRS, FinCEN, they all have their own whistleblower programs, and they all work kind of the same way, which is if you have information that exposes a violation of law, a fraud, you can come to that agency and say, 
this is the information that I have. And if they take that uh, information and they pursue an enforcement action and they collect money, meaning the government gets you know, penalties or disgorgement, um, then the whistleblower is entitled to, depending on the program, but it's typically 10 to 30% of everything that the government, yes. <laughs> there, was a, there was at least one reaction that went like this. <laughs> yeah, so it can be a lot. It can be a lot, right? Um, and, and some whistleblowers have made as much as $200 million from blowing the whistle. That was uh, just this past year in a CFTC case involving uh, the rigging of LIBOR um, uh, uh, bets. So um, that's the way those, those uh, programs work. And then the other side of the whistleblower co coin is the False Claims Act, which actually is, is the larger portion of the whistleblower world. Very relevant to healthcare, um, and it's it's a little weird law that goes back to England and uh, and started uh, during the Civil War when people were selling fake gunpowder to the Union Army, and President Lincoln said, "Well, we how do we know that it's real gunpowder or it's just sawdust?" And they came up with this. They adopted this old law that says that if you're a whistleblower you can step into the shoes of the government. They call it a key tam action, which is, means something to the effect of like stepping into the shoes of, 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 of the king. Uh, and I'm, I'm not good with Latin, so I apologize. I don't know the exact translation. But uh, effectively, you say, I accuse this company of violating the law, of perpetrating a fraud on the government. And I am going to bring a legal complaint against that company, and the government has the option to step in for me. So the, the government will actually, it takes a certain amount of time when, when the case is under seal, the government evaluates the case and says, huh, I actually think there's something to this. Step out of the way, whistleblower. I got this from here, says the Department of Justice, right? Um, or the Department of Justice is not so interested, and the whistleblower says, OK, up to me, and I will literally take this case forward under litigation and prosecute this case on behalf of the government. And if monies are recouped, then I get a portion again. In this case, I believe it's, well, if, if it's an intervened case where the government steps in, it's 15 to 25%. If it's a, a non-intervened case, it's 15 to 30%. So those are the two major sides, uh, uh, major programs that are available to whistleblowers. Why have whistleblower reward programs? Um, well, I think you know the, the best proof comes in the last session when you could hear from Erica and Cynthia, like you know how hard it is to be a whistleblower, and uh, and the government offering some incentive to counterbalance all of those hardships is important. It's also important to incentivize lawyers like me to get involved so that. There, there, there is some financial reward if we represent a whistleblower. Um, and, and then, of course, a lot of these laws involve protections for whistleblowers. So if there's retaliation against them, there are independent causes of action that the whistleblower can bring against their employer. Um, and of course, whistleblowing, you know, within the context of this, uh, this whole uh, conference, you know, to some extent, we're looking for solutions, right? We're, we're trying to find ways. And whistleblowing is one amongst many potential solutions for trying to encourage a more ethical workplace. Um, and it works, right? So the False Claims Act has collected over $30 billion for taxpayers. And the SEC and the CFTC whistleblower programs have collected 6.3 and 3 billion, respectively. So a lot of money that these programs have returned to the taxpayers. Uh, and of course, for each of these, these dollar amounts, the whistleblower is collecting some. So that's the legal landscape. Let's move on to uh, an example in the crypto industry. Now, to be fair, two, two you know, sort of upfront statements. All of these are allegations. They're, they come from the SEC complaint uh, against hydrogen technologies and associated individuals. Uh, and then uh, and that hasn't all played out. And the other is we don't know that a whistleblower was involved in this particular case. Generally. If you're a whistleblower, you don't want everybody to know that that's what you're doing. And one of the great things about uh, some of these, these programs, the SEC, the CFTC, is you can remain anonymous. It's not guaranteed, but they have a policy of confidentiality. Uh, confidentiality. So that said, what does fraud look like in the crypto industry? Well, it could look like this. Hydrogen Technologies was a company that was a spin-off of a prior company 
um, that was called Hedgeable. And Hedgeable got in trouble with the SEC, and they were bleeding money, and they needed cash quickly. And so in 2018, the CEO said, how are we going to get that money? I know this whole crypto thing, everybody loves crypto. Let's do a token. And I, you know, I imagine there was some kind of like, you know, they, 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 had, they were in a boardroom and they said, well, what does our token do? And they said, I don't know what it does, but it's going to make us money, right? And, and that's what this is right here. You've got, you've got a conversation between the CEO of Hydrogen uh, and this other outside company that they hired to create this, well, to create demand for the token, which I'll explain in a second. But this is just a, this, a, this great exchange that comes directly from the SEC complaint where uh, the, the contractor says, so everything is fiat, which just means currency, right? It's just, it's just money. And the token has no real utility. And the CEO says, not right now, right? So not a good look. You kind of want your token to have a purpose and want to be able to articulate that purpose to investors. Um, <clears throat> the other piece of this is the contractor, which is Moonwalkers, uh, they were based out of South Africa, and uh, this was from their website, where they basically say, what we do is we, we subtly direct the coin or token's price and volume upward, right? Not downward. They want the price to go up so that people will pay for the token. And then it says that they sell off. So using our in-house software, we are able to transact thousands of trades a, section, uh, a second. This allows us to create volume in such a way that's unheard of, right? Creating volume means, means like people look at your exchange and your token. Oh, people are interested in that. They're trading that. Let me get in on that. Uh, and that's the way things are often done in the crypto space. You want people to think you got the new hot thing. But don't worry. We've gone through great lengths to ensure that st our strategies in doing so look or as organic as possible. They are indiscernible from organic trades. So this is kind of like, so just so you know, if you go to our website, we do fraud for you. And you pay us for that, right? Like, so if you ever see something that is quite so transparent, like take them at their word. That is something interesting in, in the crypto sphere that like, to some extent, these services are offered because there's a market for them. And so you actually have to market yourself. Um, what uh, what the, the allegation was here uh, in, um, uh, for, for Moonwalkers was that they were hired to come in and do what's called spoofing. So spoofing is illegal, and they, they put in these trades that they never expected to consummate. So they said, you know, well, we, we'd like to buy some of this token, this hydrogen token. And then if you're one of those traders who's sort of looking to see where's there some volatility so I can get in and I can make some money, you see, oh, people are trading that token. You don't realize those aren't actual uh, bids on the token. You go in and you put in your own money. That drives up the price. And then the token holder, allegedly, in this case, hydrogen, starts to sell off its token. It's a pump and dump. Right, so you pump up the, uh, 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 the volume so that you can pump up the price, and then you sell it off. Um, and uh, so that is, uh, that is the hydrogen example. I got another one here, but I've been talking too much. I'm going to turn it back over, and we can get to it if we have time. It's fascinating. Uh, I want to turn our attention uh, now to healthcare. Uh, misinformation, misunderstandings in healthcare can result not only from deliberate lies, but perhaps more commonly from failures of disclosure, cherry picking of data, lack of transparency about the evidence base, many different reasons that foster misunderstanding of the truth. So Dr. Yen, as a doctor, a professor, and an entrepreneur, your goal is to provide people with information and resources that they need to make informed health decisions. So if you could share with us your work and some of the honesty-related challenges and problems you see in the healthcare industry. So what we've created at Pandia Health, we're the only doctor-led, the only women-founded, women-led, and the only academic physician-led company in this space. We are telemedicine and pharmacy under one roof, and our mission is to make women's lives better, starting with no one runs out of birth control on our watch. And as I've started this company in the heart of Silicon Valley, have seen the slippery slope the gray areas, and one example is knowledge. If I go to Joe Blow on the street or Henrietta on the street um, and I ask internal condom, 
do you know what that means? If I say female condom, do you know what that means? I would think if I asked you, do you want some free internal condoms? You'd be like, sure, and you would expect the male condom. But a company has gone out there and um, from my clinical experience, no heterosexual female that I've seen uses the female condom because it is this plastic thing and it's crunchy and it's just not very useful. But men who have sex use it. And so then the manufacturer of the female condom came to me and said, oh, one of your competitors just sold 200,000 units. And I was like, what? Like how? I don't envision that. And she's like, you could make it too. And so I had the opportunity there to book half a million dollars in revenue, which would look very good to my investors, but would be billed to the healthcare system, be it Medicaid or private insurance, for something that I'm pretty sure the customer didn't want. And I'd be perfectly fine mm -hmm. asking them, do you want a female condom? That I'm into. But to opt in versus opt out. And so that taught me for my company, and we made it our policy, that you have to opt in. Not, you have to uncheck this box if you don't want the thing. We blatantly leave the box unchecked. There is no defaulted check. And we go, do you want emergency contraception? Yes or no, Dr. Yen would recommend this, but it's up to you, your call. And if they check it, then we'll bill insurance. But we saw other people kind of bundle it in your you know, user agreement, we will send you free stuff. And it is technically free in that they, there's no copay, no deductible, but they're billing your insurance. So one is opt in, opt out. Another is really does the customer know what you mean when you say internal condom? Did you show a picture of this? Did you say, I don't know anyone who's hetero that uses this, but if you want some, you know, get some. And then another example is um, as a physician, we take an oath, do no harm. So I like to say I'm one of the few CEOs out there that has taken that oath. Um, can't say the same for some of my competitors out there. But um, the other part is informed consent. So when I'm selling you an STI, sexually transmitted infection kit, do I need to tell you, if you saw your doctor in person and they wrote a prescription and you went to your lab, it would be free. But because I want to make money, I have somebody that will sell it to you, D to C, direct to consumer, for 82 bucks. And for me, 82 bucks is a lot of money when your insurance should cover it, it should be free. And that's always been my thing as a pediatrician, adolescent medicine provider, is advocating for my patient. And also, insurance companies make so much money, they should pay for whatever your employer paid for or what our government paid for. It should not come out of your pocket. So there's an ethical question to be answered. Should we on, you know, here's a sexually transmitted infection kit. If you saw your doctor in person, they wrote it and you went to a lab, it would be free but you can pay 82 bucks for it here and now. And then the COVID test. People are shipping out eight COVID tests at a time, which on the one hand is great if you're really gonna use it, but how many COVID tests are gonna be stacking up in the house at home, expiring, not used, if somebody had better inventory, maybe we should limit it to two or four or six or, or stuff like that. And a similar thing with emergency contraception. So my investor slash MBA people are like, well, you should send out two packs of emergency contraception in case they get nauseous and they barf up the first one. And that sounds good, but if I sent out two emergency contraception at 100 bucks per every single customer and only one in 100 or one in 10 use it, then I've wasted a lot of money. And the standard of care is I prescribe one with 11 refills, and if you barf it up, you go to the pharmacy and you get another one. Not I send you two in case you barf it up. And so I'm debating with our MBA types, do I send two, because everyone else is sending two, but all those in-person doctors, standard of care is not to send two. It's just you would go and get another pack if, if that was the need. So um, those are just some of the slippery slope gray areas out there and the difference between somebody who's thinking about what is, I have an MPH, the impact on public health. What is the impact on our tax dollars? I as a taxpayer don't want my money going places it shouldn't go. What is the impact on the insurance that could be better spent on prevention or nutrition or other things like that? Thank you. So coming from your comments and, and thinking about honesty in this space, one of the reasons I think honesty can be particularly challenging when it comes to innovation is because there is a real or perceived tension between advocacy and honesty. Um, so Mr. Firestone, what does the law have to say about how to navigate this tension between advocacy and honesty? Please call me Darren. Okay, Darren. Because <laughs> no. I was right. calling you Tan. Right, I'm sorry. like, that's not fair. Okay. So um, I, what does the law have to say about honesty uh, versus advocacy? Um, the law makes a distinction between 
material uh, misstatements of fact or omissions on the one hand, and what is called puffery on the other. So, so puffery is like really vague statements that no investor is going to rely upon, or they're expressions of opinion. So I'll give you an example. Um, in the Sixth Circuit, there was a case uh, that involved Ford motor cars, and this was considered puffery. At Ford, quality comes first. Ford has its best quality ever. Ford is taking across the board actions to improve its quality. Now that last one, if it's really not taking any efforts to improve quality, that might be a statement of fact and it might be material if it's, if it's untrue, but there was no evidence of that in that particular case. Now contrast it with the Enron case where Jeffrey Skilling was talking to investors and he was talking about monies that were owed by California to Enron that California couldn't pay. And he said to those investors, quote, the situation in California had little impact on fourth quarter results. Let me repeat that. For Enron, the situation in California had little impact on fourth quarter results. Of course, it did have a major impact on fourth quarter results. That was a lie. And even though uh, the, the data wasn't in, he was projecting Right? He had every reason to believe that there was going to be an impact, and so uh, he, he was misleading uh, those investors. So I think there is, now these lines can be a little blurred, but those are the two categories that it fits it into. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Yen, Sophia, uh, as an entrepreneur and CEO, you talked a little bit about this a moment ago, but could you expand on how you deal with this challenge of advocating for patients, public health, versus your business, and raising capital from investors? You, you talked a moment ago about how you're working with people focus on the business side, and, um, and then you may have to stand up to that. And so how do you navigate that tension? I think it's really hard for telemedicine companies if you don't have a physician. If you're going to be writing prescriptions, I really think you should have a chief medical officer or at least a founder that is in medicine who knows the standard of care. Who knows the laws? And um, what I've seen with some companies is they'll treat their doctors or pharmacists like commodities. They'll be like, well, if they lose their license, we'll just hire another. And I'm like, do you know how hard it was to get to medical school? Do you know how much education I had to go through? And I'm just going to, you're going to destroy my career because you did something weird and shady, and I'm going to lose my license. You're just going to pay a fine, and you're going to continue to do business. And so that is not the kind of company that I run. We make sure that no one is going to get sued, so that's good for our investors, and we save money on lawyers because we don't want to get sued, and we all hate talking to lawyers because they bill by the minute. And then... Um, <laughs> We but no offense them. Unless, the good ones. Unless, unless they're, unless the they're ones. on contingency. Unless they're contingency and whistleblower and doing good for yeah. the world. But the other lawyers. No, the other ones. Um, and, um, and I think that's really important is realizing that this is healthcare. This is, we, and as I like to tell my investors, I will absolutely make money. I went to MIT, I know how to do spreadsheets, I know how to make a model that makes money. But I won't do it pushing something that is not in the patient's best interest. I absolutely know how to make money, but I don't need to do it selling somebody something. And I'm here for the long game. We purposely named our co company Pandia. Pan is every, and Dia is day. We want to be with you every day from your first period to your last breath. And so if we don't catch you on birth control, we'll catch you on acne, we'll catch you on menopause, we'll catch you on obesity. But if we mess with you and give you something horrible, or if you go look at the tweets, some people got like 92 boxes of female condoms and eight boxes of emergency contraception, and they're like, what the taxpayer? You know, and then you don't trust me, and then I can't be your friend for life. So I want to have the lifetime value of 30, 50 years, not the three to five year range. I'm here to IPO and ring that bell. I'm not here just to exit. So, um, and here to make women's lives better. But it is a challenge because I'm always getting put, well, the other companies do that. And I was like, yeah, because the other companies are wasting taxpayers' dollars. And I hope that a whistleblower will get them at some point. And if you check the news, a whistleblower did get somebody recently. And the whistleblowers got $4 million out of the 18.5. But I don't know how much lawyer fees were there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, do either one you want to Wasn't my case. About I can't. Case? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so one of the other themes of this conference is meaningful work. And 
when new in in technologies, innovations are introduced, it's often accompanied by a lot of enthusiasm, excitement about the future possibilities that the innovations can bring. However, that enthusiasm can be difficult to sustain in face of all that we've heard about today. And um, sometimes people become disenchanted with the ideas, the innovations that they once loved. And I think we may be seeing some of this now in the cryptocurrency space with some of what you shared earlier, um, widely publicized scandals, uh, failures. We heard about it in the keynote address this morning. And so there's increasing concern about the industry. Um, so Darren, the clients you represent, not just in cryptocurrency space, but in your prior work, um, you have represent clients who've seen or experienced some of the most egregious problems associated with cryptocurrency, other problems in the world. How do you avoid becoming disillusioned in the face of these problems and the corruption um, that you've encountered in your work representing whistleblowers? Um, well, my other work involves uh, the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsi in 1994. So like crypto whistleblowers, like downright cheery yeah. compared to yeah. that. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, look, I accept humanity for what it is, um, uh, which I think is generally good. Um, uh, people, I think, are generally honest and generally not too greedy, maybe a little greedy. Um, uh, but uh, there are outliers, uh, and there are people who are always going to be uh, uh, exceedingly greedy or exceedingly dishonest or take advantage of situations where they can be that and get away with it. And, and I think there are, there are sort of structural um, elements that play into whether or not a fraud is possible. So one of the reasons why I think we're seeing a lot of fraud in crypto is because crypto is generally anonymous. Uh, everybody's just a wallet number. And it's very difficult to associate a person, a name, with a wallet number. Um, and, and so in those types of situations, just like on Twitter where people are anonymous and there's all this hate speech, there's hate speech because, you know, I can, I, there's, no, there's no repercussions if I'm going to be as ugly as possible because people don't know who I am. And I also don't see them as human because I don't know who they are. And I think it, the same is true in crypto where it's easy to take advantage of people if they're just a number. It's easy to get away with it if you're just a number. Um, so whereas, you know, people, even people who start, you know, crypto companies, which many of which are good and legitimate, um, I think there are just more temptations in that particular area as, as in other areas as well. Yeah. So, so Dr. Yen, I'm curious your thoughts on this. I think healthcare, the problem of disenchantment is particularly prevalent, you know, to the extent of moral injury. Many pursue careers in healthcare because they want to help people, yet there's all these obstacles and barriers to achieving that goal. You talked about some, uh, some of this already and in our prior conversations. You've you know, talked about a number of other issues that you've seen uh, in your career in healthcare. So how do you deal with this and maintain the sense of meaning in your work, avoid the disenchantment or disillusionment with healthcare? I think it's you know, really important to focus on the end goal. And the end goal for us is to make people's lives better. We created this because women have hashtag better things to do than run to the pharmacy every single month. And we calculate women spend about 10 weeks of their lives going to the pharmacy, waiting for the medication, and coming back home. Let's reclaim that time to spend with your family or do whatever you want to do. And so because of that, I speak out about policies that could be better. I speak out about the need for a national health care, getting rid of the middleman, making the profits, taking their private jet, and that money could be better used in health care. Um, I suggest that we pay primary care doctors by the minute, like lawyers um, and accountants, um, and that we provide health care not sick care. And the example is I'm adolescent medicine, which is sex, drugs, rock and roll, a little acne, and some sports medicine. <laughs> but um, in my condom bag, you'll see here in uterus necklace, one of the only CEOs I think you'll see with those. Um, and so we, my dad said, you chose the lowest paying subspecialty of the lowest paying specialty. And I'm like, yes, I did. But I love the population. I love the opportunity to catch young people when they're starting their habits and help them to start them in a healthy way to prevent badness. So you can have sex, but don't get pregnant. You can have sex, but don't get STIs. And know about consent and know about satisfaction. And so the example I give is I prevent HIV. I prevent obesity. I prevent heart attacks. I prevent um, other diseases, diabetes. But do I get paid for any of that? No. 
Our hospital gets paid if I send the kid to bariatric surgery. Our hospital gets paid if the teenager is pregnant and has to deliver. Our hospital gets paid if there's HIV. And I see a lot of my primary care physicians get dinged because in the system, you have to see patients every 15 minutes. You have to punch out RVUs. And luckily, I think we're moving to the bill by the minute, so that's fair, because oftentimes I'll kick the parents out of the room, talk about confidential stuff, and they're like, why'd you take so long with the visit? And I was like, had you educated your child about emergency contraception, birth control, and the suicide hotline, then I wouldn't have needed to do so. Or if your school had done comprehensive sex ed, I wouldn't have spent the time. But what have I prevented? Who have I saved? I don't get any of that credit as a primary care doctor. And so um, then I advocate for comprehensive sex ed. And then as obesity, I advocate for healthy school lunch, free school lunch, which we've implemented in California, but we need to work on the healthy part. And then free breakfast as well. Because if a kid, um, if you haven't seen the movie, A Place at the Table, it's actually about food and <laughs> um, food insecurity. This young girl is diagnosed with ADHD, but she doesn't have ADHD. She's just starving. And as she's looking at the teacher, she's thinking, banana, banana. But she's just hungry, and the stomach is growling. And gosh, can't we feed our children in this country? So focus on the good you can do make companies that are there to do better and call out the people who are wasting our tax dollars or not doing it right. So, so building on this and, and looking towards the future and, and what we can do, the, the overarching goal of this forum we put on today is to generate ideas about that. How do we build a more ethical future? And we're particularly interested in actionable steps that people and organizations can take. So with this in mind, um, what can individuals, organizations, um, do today to, let's we'll start with cryptocurrency. How can we bring more ethics and honesty into the world of cryptocurrency? I'd start with uh, making projects that solve problems instead of just make money. I mean, that seems to be a, a recurring theme uh, amongst many of the speakers here. Um, I, I think we've seen a lot of just number go up uh, projects in cryptocurrency as opposed to here is a, a what cryptocurrency can actually do for you to make your life better. Uh, I think more focus on on that is is a good start. Um, I, secondly, I just think um, there needs to be more accountability in cryptocurrency, which might mean uh, more disclosure. So uh, you know, the SEC uh, Gary Gensler has already said that most cryptocurrencies are in fact securities, and our security regulation regime is disclosure based, right? So it's like. Tell me what you do. Tell me about what money you're making. Like that kind of a thing is going to help head off frauds before they happen. Hopefully, um, uh, in addition, uh, you know, more accountability could also mean less anonymity. Uh, how is that achieved? I don't claim to have all of the answers, but uh, one way uh, is in robust know your customer enforcement. So. Uh, there are laws out there um, that say that uh, if you're, for example, a cryptocurrency exchange, but it's not only exchanges, it's also uh, cryptocurrency ATM providers or uh, casinos, uh, they're supposed to know who's actually putting money with them. So they're supposed to have identifying information, and not all of them do it. Um, and a number of companies have actually paid a lot of money in fines uh, when they haven't. Uh, but even more uh, uh, robust enforcement on that degree to make it more of a standard. And also worldwide enforcement uh, uh, would, would be helpful to de-anonymizing um, cryptocurrency and making sure that people who run these exchanges can be held accountable if they're doing things wrong. Uh, lastly, um, uh, you know, just owning your mistakes. I think uh, a lot uh, you see in cryptocurrency, like, how do I make it so that I cannot be sued uh, if I do something wrong, right? Can I incorporate in the Seychelles? Uh, can, I, um, can I say that I'm not running a project, that the project is actually uh, run by what's called a DAO, which is a, de uh, a decentralized autonomous organization. It's basically a group of people who own your token. Uh, and they get to vote on certain things. But what you, and, and basically the, the way these companies often put it is like we're democracy in action. Uh, and, uh, and, and you know, all of these people make the decisions. But in reality, in, not all of them, but in a lot of situations, 
the, the originators of the project own most of the tokens and they control the DAO. And so effectively they're making, calling all the shots. But if stuff goes wrong, they say, not me, go after the DAO, which is a thousand people. How exactly do you go after a thousand people? So accountability is key, I think. Yeah, so, so how does that relate to healthcare? When, when, you hear, um, when you hear Darren's thoughts on solutions that might work in a cryptocurrency space, are they similar or different than what you're thinking could help healthcare and some of the problems that you've identified? I think transparency is absolutely key. Um, I wrote a blog piece on good versus bad telemedicine, indicators that this company doesn't quite understand healthcare or isn't quite transparent. And so one example is do they list their doctors first and last name? I noticed my competitors would put, oh, pharmacist Stacy is here to help you. Well, what is Stacy's last name and why won't you give me her last name so that I can look her up and see where she went to school and see if there's any issues with Stacy, you know, out there. So um, absolutely transparency. And then I think when it comes to consumerism, put your money where your values are. See if you trust this company. Who is the CEO? Who is the founder? And then we're all on social media. Use your megaphone to amplify the good and to point out the bad. And um, definitely look at you know, who's opt-in, who's opt-out, who's taken an oath to do no harm, who has a public health interest, who has public health training and then report anything odd that you are seeing. Because people did tweet about these unusual packages that they were getting, and maybe that's how the US government was tipped off. But I think it was the two internal nurse practitioner whistleblowers that um, gave information about that. But I've started a nonprofit called, uh, a project of Springboard Enterprise called full.co, female-founded, female-led.co's, and perhaps a company that's serving women would be best served, no offense to those without uteruses out there, by somebody with a uterus who's experienced that health issue. Or given all things equal, if you believe in parity and equality, support the female founded, support the person of color founded company to give them the opportunity. Because if you don't already know, and I'm sure you all do because this is a business school, that you know, less than two to three percent of VC and VC funded companies are women or minority owned. So, so before we open up for, for questions from the audience, I want to give you each a chance to, um, anything that, um, from what you've heard today, or conversation that you'd like to share, or questions for one another, or thoughts you have from listening to, each of your diff have different space, right? Cryptocurrency and healthcare, we often don't have uh, experts and, and people in the room talking to one another about a common theme that affects us all, and honesty. Um, and so, do either of you have any questions or comments? I just think that, Crypto is very different in the anonymity. And whereas medicine should be, you should know who's taking care of you, and you should have informed consent, you should have all of your options. But what struck me today in today's discussions is who is going to hold you know, everybody responsible? And I love the line that whistleblowers should be the last line of defense. And if the whistleblower stepped up, then so many people have failed along the way. And I love that a business school is taking this on because that's really where it needs to be. Um, the VCs need to be on this, as well as the future CEOs. And every employee should know that they are empowered and enabled to speak up. But hopefully it doesn't come to the whistleblower and it gets there as part of the company policy before then. But um, I, I have a question, which is, um, you know, since you're broadly speaking in the telehealth world, um, uh, what's, you know, it, it, I think there are probably companies out there, or that we've heard uh, examples of companies out there that are taking advantage of telehealth in the sense that they're offering non-standard of care. They're, you know, they're not seeing their patient in, in person, so that can create problems. Um, but it doesn't necessarily need to. So how do you, what particular problems does uh, telehealth medicine uh, present and how do you solve them so that you can maintain uh, standard of care and you can and maintain an ethical practice? That is um, such an important point. So our company is asynchronous. So there is no video, there is no telephone, but we give you, once you sign up with us, 364 day access 
to talk with our doctor by chat asynchronously. Our doctors love it, the patients love it. They've actually shown for confidential stuff, like when was the last time you had sex? Are you really sure you're not pregnant? It's actually better to be a questionnaire than a voice or video because you feel I might be judging you or something like that. Um, there's absolute limitations to telehealth. Anybody that's telling you they can do primary care purely by telehealth, I wouldn't do that if it was me, my daughter, my friend. Because as a pediatrician, we're always listening to the heart, looking in the ear, looking in the back of your throat. We can't do that on the video. I've tried. <laughs> it just doesn't work very well. There are some things that are just meant to be done in the office. And our company is doing low-risk, recurrent medications, things that American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has said birth control should be over the counter. And as long as you ask these 20 questions, check a blood pressure within the past 365 days, you're good to go. Acne is good for online, but it'd be even better if we got better quality pictures. Menopause is similar. We can do that. Obesity we can do. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. But some things really need to be done in person until we have that technology. The hard part is um, the medical societies are writing laws for everybody. And that really um, irritates me because you have to realize that birth control is not the same as a controlled substance ADHD drug. That mental health is great on video and phone. You don't need to physically touch the patient. And so for Washington State to mandate that all telemedicine has to be done with an in-person phone or video component when that is a disservice to confidential reproductive health services or transgender or anything stigmatized, if it's in the doctor's opinion, and in general, you could poll 10 doctors, not just one who's trying to make a ton of money or something, but he polled 10 doctors, and seven or eight out of 10 agree that it's perfectly fine, or if there's been you know, standards at the national level where they declared it's fine, then maybe it's fine, and you step aside and leave medicine to the doctors. But don't issue a blanket statement that, without thinking about the very different specialties of medicine. Thank you for bringing that up, because that is one of my pet peeves. The other pet peeve is um, that as a physician, I took a national exam. I took the American Board of Pediatrics. And it's not like law, where there are different laws in every state. Medicine should be practiced the same internationally, but definitely nationally. But in order to do telemedicine, I have to get a license state by state by state. And I've been fingerprinted five times. You would think that if my fingerprints were good enough for California, it should be good enough for New York, Florida, Texas. And Michigan somehow loves this company called Identigo. But because it's Michigan and I'm in California, the closest place is three hours away. So I was like, it's not worth my time to do a six hour round trip to serve Michigan. We'll just have to wait on that one. But if you truly want access, to the best care everywhere. And that is the beauty and the potential of telemedicine. I'm bringing UCSF, Stanford, and even a level up beyond that to wherever you have internet and a mailbox. And we're standardizing care. And we're catching stuff. The thing I love about telemedicine is its protocols. And so everybody has to answer every question. If you come in my office, I get distracted. Or I send in a med student, they forget to ask that question. And you have migraines with aura, you shouldn't get the standard birth control. But we ask every single time. And we've caught some patients that shouldn't be on drugs because of protocols. Protocols are the future, regardless telemedicine or not. But with telemedicine, they're definitely implemented. OK, we have uh, time to open it up to the audience for, for questions. Hi, uh, thank you for doing this great job. My question is from Darren. Since you mentioned cryptocurrency, lately I have seen this trend that this popular celebrities with the large number of followers on social media, they have been endorsing certain cryptocurrencies. So if any misconduct happens, do we, uh, are, are these uh, celebrities liable? Will they, help be account will they be held accountable for their actions? because they endorsed certain cryptocurrency. I really thank you for asking this question because it is my next example that I didn't get to. Unprompted. So uh, 
I swear she's not a plant. <laughs> uh, so, so let me first answer from a legal perspective, and then I'll give you the example. So the answer is it depends, right? If, uh, if you are a celebrity who's in a commercial, just like you might advertise Hertz, you're not necessarily endorsing the product. Right. Uh, so when Matt Damon was on Crypto.com or when Larry David was on the FTX Super Bowl ad, uh, like, to me anyway, that was not an endorsement. They were an actor in a commercial. Right. But this example, Ethereum Max, Kim Kardashian actually endorsed the product with this ad on her Instagram. And so she says, you know, look, it's my friends. They just told me about this uh, Max token. And the only thing she has to indicate that she's being paid for this is at the end, hashtag ad, right? Um, and uh, she was supposed to, because this is an endorsement, say, I am endorsing, and this is how much I'm being paid to endorse, which was $250,000. She ended up being fined uh, $1.2 million uh, by the SEC uh, for this endorsement. Uh, and she wasn't alone. There were other... Uh, celebrities as well involved in this. But I wanted to make one other point about Ethereum Max, which again, uh, I'm going to give the disclaimer that there, there is no uh, enforcement action that I'm aware of against them at this point. There is a class action against them. But I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, how maybe to be skeptical when you see a, a, a cryptocurrency uh, a project. So Ethereum Max, if you went to their uh, website, and you wanted to figure out what they do, you would see this. Um, and it, it, I, I guess I'll read it. I, uh, I apologize for reading a slide that's in front of you. But it says, our, our vision is to build a robust and scalable ecosystem that fully maximizes the power of DeFi, creating a wide range of products for our community that encompasses, so far, anyone know what it, know what it does? So it, if you get through the whole paragraph, you will not know what this company does. <laughs> Right, and then um, so there was an article about it in in CoinDesk, which is like the most major uh, cryptocurrency uh, media outlet out there. And it says a CoinDesk reporter searched the uh, Ethereum Max website for information about how to unlock the purported cultural perks uh, that come with the Max tokens uh, they have purchased, but they were unsuccessful. So not only is it hard to figure out what they do, if you kind of figure out you're supposed to get these perks and you try to get them, you can't quite get them, you should start thinking, well, maybe, maybe this isn't an actual you know, project that I should be investing in. Uh, Forbes later came out with an article uh, uh, about the project, and it said that uh, effectively Ethereum Max, according to the article, was a pump and dump scheme. And it wasn't the first time the, the creators of the project had been involved in a pump and dump scheme. But they're getting Kim Kardashian, who uh, you know has this huge fan base, uh, many of whom are not sophisticated investors because you know, like they include my 13-year-old daughter. Um, and, and they're marking, the, you know, hey, Kim likes this thing. But they're not sophisticated enough to go and look at, at the website and think, this doesn't smell right. Right, but hopefully, you know, we can sort of get people to to uh, to have their their senses out for this sort of thing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is another quick uh, crypto question. Um, with the, your clients that you represent, has there, any, has there ever been gray area with the law and things that may not be formed yet where you really couldn't advocate on their issue because it may not even exist yet? Absolutely. So uh, whether it's in crypto or in any whistleblower scenario, you've got to make sure that there is a legal remedy. Um, so, you know, the, the often... The, the best example of this is actually in the False Claims Act uh, arena where there's all sorts of really, really complicated uh, laws about what constitutes a false claim. And you have to know the law and figure it out and determine whether or not this is something you want to, um, is this a case you want to take because the law might not be entirely clear on it. In terms of the cryptocurrency uh, area, 
I mean, there's always going to be questions. For example, uh, is the token that's at issue uh, actually a security? Um, you know, you have to do that analysis to determine whether it is. Now, most tokens, as I said before, are, but maybe you say, well, and I've done this before, I file with both the SEC and the CFTC because it's either a security or it's a commodity. So you always got to do the legal analysis, and the legal analysis is not always crystal clear. Hi, I want to thank you both. Um, I have a question just in general about privacy in the sense that I think that crypto, uh, one of the reasons for crypto being founded was desires for anonymity. And so then there's sort of a societal benefit of regulation versus a personal desire for anonymity or privacy. And I would ask the same issues around healthcare in that there are patients have a desire for privacy, but you talk about you know, different states and different states are wrestling with issues around privacy and right to know and parental right to know and consent. And so I'd be interested to hear how you think about this sort of general societal tension. I'll go first. Um, there are HIPAA laws, the Healthcare Information Portability and Accountability Act, and we make sure that we adhere to that at every single level, because as a doctor, I'm well trained on HIPAA. And so our programmers, to our patient care advisors, to any contractors that have any chance of touching anything related to patient information, we separate out. We also, on our marketing end, separate out prospects, leads, who are marketing leads, once they answer a health question or once they've paid us and become our customer, then we take them out of that marketing and we specifically don't do retargeting or other kind of marketing methods because we don't want in any way for them to be labeled a birth account, birth control, because um, there's stigma and there's other issues, political, et cetera, in that area. So that the good news is for healthcare, a lot of it's covered by HIPAA. With respect to parental consent, I am an adolescent medicine specialist, so very acutely aware of the different state-by-state state right to um, consent for the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of pregnancy, the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of sexually transmitted infections. Most states will allow a minor to consent for that because they would rather they prevent unplanned pregnancy than they end up pregnant and having to do with an unplanned, unwanted pregnancy, and the same goes for sexually transmitted infections on a public health level. However, Pennsylvania is one of the more conservative states. And unfortunately, with the, Ro the reversal of Roe or um, then what they decided in the Dobbs case, um, Pennsylvania has a 24-week limit. They have a waiting period. They have um, parental consent unless you can get a judicial waiver. And I come from California, which is anybody of any age um, know that nationally pediatricians and teachers and other people are mandated reporters. So if we think that anyone is being sexually abused or abused or taken advantage of in any way, we have to report it is our legal responsibility to do so. And so when we launch state by state, we check the um, adolescents' right to consent. And um, particularly for the conservative states, if they're under 18, we flag the patient, we color code it, we have our own system red, and we have the patient care advisor contact the patient. And um, in the liberal states, are you using this for birth control? Um, acne, making hashtag periods optional or a combination thereof. If they say birth control, then the liberal states were good to go. If they're under 18 and you know, red states, uh, Texas, Florida, then we ask um, for parental consent and we make sure that we get parental consent. But again, I can't say that all non-doctor run companies are aware of these laws or necessarily following them. We've seen definitely some issues with Facebook and um, Google ads because of the want to market to these people, but then you've targeted them, you've identified them, and that's a problem. But we make sure that we um, hash, which is, I guess, um, mixing it up, co decoding it so that nothing is out there. And we're very acutely aware of who is a prospect and who is a patient customer. Uh, oh, uh, I want to make sure we, would we, uh, I, could, I could take on a little bit of that question or we sure, could take yeah, we have a couple. Um, yeah, if you have any thoughts you want to share or we can. Uh, sure, I, I think uh, 
there's definitely a tension between privacy and uh, and regulation um, in in the crypto sphere. Uh, it's a huge issue. Uh, m my personal take on this is uh, the privacy advocates in the crypto sphere who are pr advocates for financial privacy are generally driven by a mistrust of government, uh, which I think is um, you know is a fair uh, it's it's a fair feeling to have, and that's particularly true when you're speaking of governments that uh, don't respect privacy at all. Um, and and but here in the U.S. I generally think we do respect privacy. Uh, having been a former uh, prosecutor, federal prosecutor, I, uh, I know that my colleagues and I took privacy very seriously. And honestly, I never came across a government worker. I have many, many friends in the, in the federal government. Nobody cares about your personal life and your personal privacy. What we generally think of, you know, sort of colloquially as privacy, we just care about are you committing crimes? Uh, and so, you know, when you talk about sort of being able to access large amounts of data to determine whether or not there may be patterns that reveal crime, that may at a certain level be violating some kind of financial privacy. But in my mind, my personal opinion, uh, it's, it's worth it because it is not so, such a core element of privacy it's like the privacy one has in one's home or the privacy one has in one's love life. Um, uh, and it is worth it for the, you know, to go after money laundering and tax evasion, et cetera, et cetera. So one thought I, I had that I wanted to share in listening to you both throughout the day and, and especially in the last comments you made about how you're doing this research state to state, we often think of honesty as just truth telling, telling the truth or not, you know, making material misstatements or not. And I think it's so much more. And there's an element of truth seeking and really being open to updating your beliefs, finding out information. Um, you know, this, this, uh, examples you've shared about when you prioritize ethics and honesty, it goes much, well beyond just not making a misleading advertisement. Right? You have to do the work and, and find out the information. Um, I think the examples you shared as well. Um, so there's this truth seeking and also this fostering understanding and, and that involving disclosure and how you communicate it and checking for understanding. And I think that comes through in, in these examples of when these things go wrong, right? whether it's in cryptocurrency and people being actively misleading um, customers, consumers, the, the general public, or whether the technology really is so technical that it's hard to understand. Certainly the cases you shared, it, it seemed very deliberate, but I think there, there's more there. Um, I think we're at time, but I wanted to thank you all and thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.